Lord Frank Margeson was the grandson of Francis and Betty Liggett. Many who had the privilege of meeting Lord Margeson and hearing him share stories of his family and their connection with Swamiji experienced history come alive through the charm of this gifted and knowledgeable storyteller. Sri Sarada Society very much welcomed his help in the making of Swami Vivekananda at Ridgely, both with writing the narrative and visualizing the video content. The outcome of this very special time is now digitally preserved and offered for viewing in Frank's memory. Ridgely Manor is a stately house reminiscent of southern mansions. Built in 1892 by Francis H. Leggett and designed by the well-known architect Charles Coolidge Haight, it is located in the Hudson Valley of New York in the village of Stone Ridge near Kingston. Today, the Ridgely Estate, consisting of the manor and two smaller residential buildings, sits on 85 acres of rolling hills nestled between the Catskill Mountains to the north and the Shawangunk Mountains to the southwest. It was in 1895 that Francis H. Leggett met and invited Swami Vivekananda to Ridgely. They became good friends. Mr. Leggett was a prosperous New York businessman and the first president of the New York Vedanta Society upon its formal incorporation in 1898. Swamiji visited Ridgely three times. The first visit occurred in April of 1895. He returned that same year in December and then again the summer of 1899. On this last visit, he stayed for 10 weeks. Never before had he spent so much time in the West in one place. In August 1899, upon his arrival at Ridgely Manor, Swamiji would have proceeded along this same drive, traveling in a horse-drawn carriage, the sweet country air bringing relief from the heat-laden atmosphere of New York City. Since then, the manor has hardly changed, though the view of the mountains was more open then because the mature trees so beautiful today were newly planted. Ridgely has remained in the Leggett family for three generations. Inherited by Frances, the daughter of Frances H. Leggett, it became the property of her son, Lord Margeson, in 1977 upon her death. The front door opens into a small foyer leading to the hall, one of the several spacious first floor living rooms. Swamiji gave many evening talks in this room, talks lasting long into the night. Marie Louise Burke describes one such evening in her book, New Discoveries, as follows. Before a roaring fire in the great hall of the manor, he spoke of God and man with the authority and grandeur of the prophet that he was, carrying the mind of his listeners far beyond their accustomed worlds. In one of the Leggett's guest books, Swamiji's signature is entered on August 3, 1900. On that date, he was staying with the Leggett's in their house in Paris, which he used as his headquarters while attending the International Paris Exposition. This book is now at Ridgely. Sister Nivedita signed the same guest book. Speaking of Betty Leggett, she wrote, a guest who thanks her hostess best by the hope that Indian women in future may pay her sincerest compliment of imitation. To have homes such as she can create would be the finest power of a great womanhood. Betty McLeod became the wife of Frances H. Leggett in 1895. She was largely responsible for creating an open and free atmosphere at Ridgely. With her sense of beauty and refinement, she graciously attended to every detail necessary to make her guest feel welcomed. Her younger sister, Josephine McLeod, actively supported and stood by Swamiji throughout his early struggles in the West. Through her, some of the best thinkers and writers of the West came to know of Swami Vivekananda and the Ramakrishna order. In the summer of 1899, quiet afternoons were an occasion for undisturbed naps Maud Stum, an artist and guest at Ridgely, recalls seeing Swamiji. Lying at full length on the green couch in the hall, sound asleep like a tired child. 
This same couch, still at Ridgely, is located today in the music room. To the south of the hall is the dining room where Swamiji would have taken his meals. Swamiji would have been seated to Mr. Leggett's right in these same comfortable armchairs. The black marble mantelpiece and the massive sideboards are also original furnishings. Betty Leggett knew of Swamiji's love for chocolate ice cream. She could get him to return to his chair at the table by simply announcing that ice cream would be served. Swamiji would wait for it. With a smile of expectancy and pure delight, a smile described as seldom seen on the face of anybody over 16. On the second and third floors of the manor are the sleeping quarters. There are seven spacious bedrooms and five and one half baths on the second floor and two bedrooms, one bath on the third floor. Whenever at Ridgely, Josephine McLeod, affectionately known as Tontine, used this bedroom on the second floor. To her, Ridgely was one of the most sacred places in the world because she believed it truly was Swamiji's home. Also on the second floor, and next to Tontine's room, is Betty Leggett's bedroom. This third bedroom was said to be used by Swamiji on his first two visits to Ridgely in 1895, according to Francis Leggett, Lord Margison's mother. From every bedroom window, there is a breathtaking view of the surrounding countryside. From above the front entrance, spacious green lawns stretch north as far as the eye can see towards the Catskill Mountains. Maud Stum remembers Swamiji. With his flame-colored robes draped about him, what a figure he was as he strode the lawns of Ridgely. His stride came nearer to the poet's description of a step that spurned the earth than anything I ever expect to see again. Also seen from this view is the Prophet's Pine, a beautiful towering tree named after Swamiji. Planted at Ridgely by Frances as a young girl under the direction of her aunt Josephine McLeod, it was taken from a sapling of the Greenacre tree under which Swamiji taught while attending the Greenacre conferences in 1894 in Elliott, Maine. The round porch dominates the west side of the manor. This porch can be recognized in a photograph taken at this spot in 1899, picturing Swami's Vivekananda, Turiyananda, Abedananda, Josephine McLeod, Betty Leggett, and her daughter, Alberta. The stables, a second residential house on the estate, is located a little distance to the east of the manor. Once used to stable the estate's horses, it is now a garage, storage area, and two rented apartments. Rented property and fields covers the yearly maintenance expenses at Ridgely. Located to the north of the manor and across the driveway is the third residential building named the Casino, it was once used as a large playhouse for the entertainment of Mr. Leggett's guests. In those days, it was even equipped with a bowling alley. No longer a part of the Ridgely estate, the little cottage is a five-minute stroll northwest from the manor, though its size indicates it is certainly not little and it is something more than a cottage. It was here that Swami's Vivekananda, Turiyananda, and Abedananda resided on their 10-week visit in 1899. Swamiji was described as taking solitary early morning walks around the grounds, generally along a path that led from the little cottage past the casino and joining a road that led across an open field. At the end of this road was a huge spreading oak. There he would meditate. Located south of the manor, is a house named The Inn that was a part of the estate until 1981. It was in this house that Sister Nivedita, having joined Swamiji and his party in September of 1899, finished writing her book, Kali, the Mother. 
The inn was also the setting of an auspicious event on November 5, 1899. At the close of his 10-week stay, Swamiji blessed Sister Nivedita and Sarah Bull, two great pillars of his work, in a private, simple ceremony here. Putting one hand on Sarah's head and one on Nivedita's, he said, I give you all that Ramakrishna Paramahamsa gave to me. What came to us from a woman, I give to you two women. Do what you can with it. I cannot trust myself. Women's hands will be the best anyway to hold what came from a woman, the mother. I cast the load on you. I have borne it all this time, and now I have given it up. Frank, tell us how your grandfather met Swamiji. Well, the story is quite interesting, as related down the years by my great aunt, Josephine McLeod Tantine in the family, and it goes as follows. Um, she and my grandmother, Betty, not yet uh, Betty Leggett, still Betty Sturgis, were attending Swamiji's lectures in New York in the season of 1895, and they were having dinner one evening with my grandfather at the Waldorf, but had told him that they couldn't stay after dinner. He said, very well, we'll just have to have dinner together, but where are you going to afterwards? And they said, we're going to a lecture. And he said, well, meant I come too? And they said, of course. <laughs> and the lecture they were going to was one given by Swamiji. And at the end of the lecture, my grandfather went up and introduced himself and said, um, Swamiji, will you do me the honor of having dinner with me? I would like to introduce you to my friends. And Swamiji accepted, and that was how they became friends. Oh, Our second question then is, um, what was your grandfather's relationship with Swamiji? How would you describe that? Well, it was very close. Um, I must turn to my mother's book late and soon for the complete answer and read you what she says, because that really describes it extremely well. Um, she writes, For Frank, such a friendship was unique. As man to man, he recognized in the young monk someone he wanted immediately to know. They were very different in background, in age, in purpose. But there was a spiritual link between them. Frank, successful man of business, typical of Western civilization of his day, middle-aged, conservative, and Vivekananda, Hindu monk, young, dynamic, dedicated to a life of service, of no possessions, these two were friends. And of course, as I've related, it was Frank who introduced the Swami, socially and personally, both to Josephine and to Betty. My grandfather is, has, is recorded as saying, Vivekananda is the greatest man I ever saw. And when he was asked why, he answered, he has more common sense than anyone I've ever known. In fact, in the year that they met, 1895, um, Swamiji came to Ridgely very soon afterwards for his first visit, um, for Easter, April, for 10 days. Uh, then he went to New Hampshire, to Camp Percy, Lake Christine, to stay with my grandfather and grandmother, from where they announced their engagement to be married he then went over to Paris to attend their wedding in person with my grandfather. They traveled together across the Atlantic. And on his return, he came again to Ridgely for Christmas for another 10 days before returning to New York to resume his work there. Your mother must have been awfully young when Swamiji was visiting Ridgely. Do you remember any incidents at all in which she was involved with Swamiji? Oh yes, there was one very direct uh, occasion of contact. Um, when Swamiji blessed my mother, and this is related by Alberta, her half-sister, and recorded both in Mary Louise Burke's book and in Late and Soon, goes as follows. Um, one morning, as Alberta told it in later years, the child came in from the garden, that's my mother, some flowers in her hand. She gave them to Swamiji, who said gravely, in India, we give flowers to our teachers, and he pronounced over her some Sanskrit words. Now, the strange part of this is not only that, that she was blessed, which after all was an enormous 
honor and very special. But because of Tantine, my English grandmother, Lady Isabel Margeson, also had invited Swamiji to give talks in her house in London. And my father, as a young boy, was also blessed by Swamiji. Um, I understand that Swamiji had a very strong relationship with many members of your family, but he also had a strong relationship with Ridgely itself, didn't he? Yes, he did. He had a very strong relationship with, with the family, but beyond that, he also had his own very special relationship with Ridgely. He was not forced in any way to apply himself or to behave according to standards imposed on him. Uh, and he enjoyed this sense of the renewal of his energy and the renewal of the life force. Now, the significance for him perhaps is best summed up by Mary Louise Burke again in her concluding remarks about the 10 weeks the longest visit he had here, his third and longest, when he returned from India feeling very exhausted and came straight from New York on his disembarkation with my grandmother and grandfather. And after this time of renewal, which I've attempted to describe, she writes, the great summer, which was, it was afterwards known as that period of 10 weeks, so restful that it may have added almost three years to Swamiji's life. What more can one say?